Hello. How are y'all doing today? Thanks for joining me for the video. Chef Chris will not be joining us today because I only have one glass. And he said he refuses to share a drink with me. No, actually, we are just exceptionally busy. And uh, we've just got like seven different things going on. And so he can't join me for the video. But I will carry on my wayward son. We will try to get this video together with just as much information as if we had Chef Chris alongside. So, of course, my name is Ed. I'm the sommelier here at Old North State Winery. Of course, we make delicious wines. You might actually hear Tyler, our winemaker, just over on the other side of the wall, banging stuff around because he's uh, in the midst of bottling and packaging. A uh, really exciting time for us, for sure. Uh, we got a red blend and a Riesling that are that are getting back into circulation that we've been low on, so we're excited about that. But the reason why we do these videos is because we do basically a Thursday night tasting club where we explore the wines of the world so that everyone can understand why every place in the world is important, including the Yakima Valley where we make wines. If you don't know what the world of wine is like, you don't know why the Yakima Valley is special. And gosh darn it, everyone should know more about wine. So the best way to do that is drink wine. So we do four wines here in person every Thursday night in downtown Mount Airy. That's Mount Airy, North Carolina, just to be, be clear. We've had quite a, people, quite a few people calling from Maryland, uh, just thinking that maybe we're in Maryland. We're not, There's a, that's a different Mount Airy. We are in North Carolina. And we do these tastings, we do four wines every week. That gives us over, usually right at 200, depending on how many. We try to do it every single week. We do about 50 a week or 50 a year, so we, we usually hit about 200 wines a year, and so over five years we've reached a thousand wines, and that is an education that we can all live with, right? Delicious education. So we, we want to have all of the wines in our portfolio so that we know which wines to choose when we're dining out, where we're having friends, or if you're running solo like me, you still want the best one. So we are uh, treating most of all the ones that we have here are going to be sub $50, usually uh, almost uh, always under 30 and oftentimes under 20. Uh, we do want to keep wines affordable and certainly there's something to be said for expensive wines. I know I sure do love them, but I think those are pretty much easier for people to purchase and understand because they have so much press and reputation behind them. I kind of facilitate the, the very cloudy area of sub $50 wines where the bulk it seems of wines are, and it's a much cloudier, murkier, mercury, murky -er, there it is, uh, selection. So there's a lot more swings and misses, I believe, in those genres and those price points. So I really want to work on getting those straightened out for us so we can spend our money wisely and enjoy our beverages at any, at any cost, truly. But, you know, we can, it's not that we don't do nice wines. We certainly do expensive wines as well uh not I mean, they don't have to be expensive to be nice you know where i'm going with this but i think it's important to you gotta peel back a lot of losers as a matter of fact today i've had a tasting and i have so many tastings and there's so many losers that's the thing that everybody thinks that i'm just pulling delicious wines leisurely out and i've vetted so many before i do any of these videos with you guys or before we do anything in person it's just it's really the cream of the crop of what i've tasted and so it's up to me to drink as much wine as possible for you guys that's what i do so uh today i had one it tasted exactly like bug spray not the kind like off to keep the bugs off of you but insecticide like you spray for you know like cockroaches and wasps and it has haunted me the better part of the afternoon. I cannot get rid of that. It just, I, I tasted it, it freaked me out. I was like, what is going on here? I taste something really familiar. And then it dawned on me, yikes. So 
I'm not going to pour that kind of wine for you. The funny thing was, it's a really big name too. I'm not, I don't, I'm not here to bash. I'm just here to, to bring you the best. I'm not going to sit around and talk about bad wine. So somewhere, somebody's going to enjoy that wine. So I, I, maybe I shouldn't even say it's bad. It's just like, it's just not for me. And I'm certainly not going to pair it with food that Chef Chris has created or when I'm cooking something that I've created. So we want to we want to get to those those happy places that I think most people can agree on. So we've been doing a lot of uh, rosés. We have a we're kind of making some changes to our wine list. We've been taking some things off, adding some things, and I was looking to make a change on my rosé. And so I reached out to my buddy Carrie at Winebow and was looking for something that I could pour by the glass but not your everyday typical type of rosé. And boy, he, he reminded me of, of a producer that I really love for Cabernets and Merlots, and that's Bernard Griffin. Now, this is a 40-year winery. I mean, we are talking in terms of Washington State, you know, there's, I mean, we're talking about one of the first, one of the most important, um, you know, they're winemakers, the longest tenured winemaker continuously ever. Of course, you know, Washington State hasn't had a huge amount of wine influence in the world until, you know, things really started getting cranked up in the 80s. And, you know, now we're seeing that the vision that, that people like Griffin had, um, you know, there's... There's an un, almost no ceiling to what can happen in Washington State. It is so agricultural. Uh, there's not many big cities. There's nothing to really stop it. There's there's a huge amount of land up there. It's already risen to the second most uh, wine production in terms of volume. And I'm not saying it's going to catch California, but it's going to grow. It's going to grow immensely, exponentially. I think. You're seeing people like Paul Hobbs buying property there, you know, one of the greatest winemakers of our lifetime, uh, certainly one of the most influential people in modern winemaking history. He's buying up land there. Boy, there must be something to it. Remember, we have the Cascade Mountains that are creating a, a rain shadow, so it's a very dry area. This is very important because if we look at how many of these great, consistent wine regions are arid. And you know this. This is a bonus as long as you can get some water to the vines, enough to keep them alive. You know, you just don't want to kill them, obviously, but you do want them to struggle a little bit. And so that is built in there. Uh, remember, there's also that all those snow-capped streams, alluvial streams, that we can capture water in this area. So if you need water, it is there. It's just not going to be coming out of the sky and vines really like this. So dry air is good for vines, you know. Even, you know, if we have humid areas like uh, Mediterranean style things, if you look into the, to the great wines of the Southern Rhone, they need extremely high winds to compensate for the humidity to, to keep the grapes from molding or getting rot inside of them. They have the mistral um, breezes, well, it's more than a breeze, but you get the idea. You can grow in humid areas, but you've got to have something to compensate for it. It's way easier if it's a dry area. Look at Argentina's huge success, and they have very little rain. Also, alluvial streams for water, though, so they're they're covered there. So, areas that are on the move, and I would say Washington is at the top of the list for me, and I continue to be just, I don't know, blown away? Is it, I mean, is that safe to say? I don't know. I mean, I'm a huge fan of wine winemakers like Griffin and Janik, and I just think that there's just a huge upside uh, of growth that's going to be coming, and I'm excited for them. I've had friends move out to Washington State. They absolutely love it out there. Of course, you know, we've featured Matthew's wine here. There's, uh, there's just a, there's so many delicious things to drink but we're going to start here with a fun little rosé of Sangiovese. So Sangiovese, 
the red grape, you know, I've, I've guess I've kind of crammed a lot of Italian wine down everybody's throats the last couple months ever since I got back from Northern Italy and I warned everybody that I would be on a on an Italian kick, but here we are in Washington. So I'm kind of off the hook. I'm not giving you Italian wine, but I am giving you Italian varietal. And it is a beautiful rosé, beautiful color here, as you can see, uh, picks up the light. And a lot of people that know me know that I really do like the color of wine. Not many people really think about that, but you know, it's just like food. When you look at food, if it's plated, if it looks tasty, chances are you're gonna like it even more. You've already made up your mind it's gonna be good. I kind of have a little bit of that going on with this one. And many rosés for that matter. So I wanna make note, this is a dry rosé. We're not talking about anything sweet, but we are gonna talk about something being fruity. And of course, one of the things that people have a difficulty understanding is when they taste a wine and it's really fruity, they're gonna automatically say, oh, it's sweet, but it's really not sweet. It just tricks you into thinking it's sweet because fruity in your brain is sweet. And in wine, that is not necessarily a correlation. Residual sugar left in the wine is what makes it sweet fruit. Uh, in, this, in this version, this is, this is just a grape. It doesn't, you know, even though you're gonna taste things like strawberries or cherries, they're not in there. This is just a fermented grape. So there's a little bit of trick of the mind there. When you're describing wines, it doesn't necessarily correlate to real life things. So, uh, you know, when you say pineapples and bananas and things of that nature, they're not in the wine. And so also sugar is not in the wine, particularly in this one. Now there are certainly sweet wines out there that have plenty of residual sugar and we can label those as sweet. We just did a chef's table yesterday uh, it was wildly popular and we had a port wine and it was a tawny and it was fortified of course and yes it did indeed have residual sugar by design so here we have something that doesn't have residual sugar but it does have a beautiful fruitiness which is really i think important to this wine this wine does have quite an assertive zippiness to it the acidity here is it, it is well controlled I would say it is definitely a bright get your attention kind of of acidity and you know I love it I'm, I'm a huge fan of anything brine pickled some people say I might be pickled but whatever it takes to keep going that was that was what I was uh, told that I've, no one's ever seen a sick pickle so I eat all my pickles and drink all my wine. I'm in good shape. So this wine is going to be a great complement because of that high acidity. So many dishes, bright dishes, fresh dishes, you know, salads, cheeses. Um, I, I believe Chef was is going to to take on some Saskatchewan Cove cheese for it, the Walden, which is a uh, it's like a spreadable, almost nutty brie style cheese that uh, when you have the counterbalance of something a little bit earthy fatty with something uh, tart and fruity you're going to really see how that that contrasting style of beverage versus food really does work now there's always this camp for you know people like their red wine with cheese and some people say well you know white wines are better for cheese and i tend to agree with that camp but rosés get left out of that conversation and i think it's time to talk about how great rosés certain rosés are with cheese now i like my i like my rosés a little more serious you know i don't like the real sweet ones for the most part there's some exceptions but for the most part, I want bone dry rosés. I want them to be refreshing. I want them to be zippy, like this is, and get my attention. This is uh, banging in here around 13% alcohol too. So in terms of, you know, there's not a lot of compromise in the alcohol department. Uh, I Like I alluded to before, I'm a big fan of Griffin's Merlot and Cavs. They do all kinds of other interesting things. Uh, as well, but that one, those two wines have always, you know, I found 
to be more indicative of what Washington State wines are. This to me is more like what's coming. You know, the the using different varietals than what we're accustomed to, presenting it in the form of a rosé. And I think that there is unlimited potential in this area, and I'd love to see how people are utilizing creativity in such an important area. Um, I wish you were here right now with me to enjoy this glass of wine. Beautiful nose. It's a simple, delicate nose. And don't let that fool you because the palate is a big boy. One of the things that also I want to make note about this one, it is still very full texturally. Oftentimes brighter wines are a little thin on the palate. Uh, you know, kind of going to that watery. This still has a nice weight to it. And I think that's going to be very attractive to a lot of people out there. Um, I can't help but just think about slightly underripe cherry and strawberry. Uh, just like, you know, when they're like, you're just so anxious to pick one because you can't wait because it's been a crazy long winter and the strawberries come up first, you know, in terms of fruit. And uh, you just pick it just a hair too early because you can't wait. That's what it, that flavor reminds me of. Uh, it's not any, there's no bitterness this glass, you know, and of course, being a huge fan of Provence, I expect to be a little bitter uh, notes in the finish on Provence, and that's what makes it so interesting, uh, Provence-style wines, and why they're so great with food, in my opinion. Uh, but this is more of a, it, it is certainly a food wine, it, it, and I think you'll, you'll see that right away, but it's also just like a front porch sipper. You don't need food with it. You can just enjoy it poolside. Um, of course, I would think, you know, I think it'd be hard pressed to miss this in any time because it could go for a brunch, absolutely lunch, and it's serious enough to have for dinner. A really versatile wine uh, from a great producer. Really happy to showcase that. I'm actually one of the few wines that I do at these tastings that end up on the wine list. That is a wine list for here at the winery because you know what? I like it and I want it around. So cheers to that. Mm -mm -mm. Well, we just had the big July 4th. We are two days removed. And of course I was very fortunate to get to ride in the big parade and we had the doors off the Jeep and we had buckets of candy cookies, Rice Krispie treats, bracelets, necklaces, rubber ducks. We filled the whole trunk up with, with stuff for the thousands of kids that line the streets of Mount Airy. And, you know, I can't think of a better way to spend my money than gifting little kids dressed up with, with cute little stars and stripes dresses and t-shirts and waving their little flags and the, the kids are so polite around here thank you thank you i mean it just melts your heart to see how and when the kids are screaming ducky when you give them a rubber duck i tell you what nothing feels quite as good as seeing a kid light up and that's kind of way this wine makes me feel Ugh. absolutely delicious all right so I did mention South Africa a little bit earlier. Uh, this is Rots, and it is R-A-A-T-S, Family Wines. This is a red blend. It's a beautiful Bordeaux blend. Got extremely high ratings on this, uh, this particular vintage. We have done previous vintages before, so this is technically not a rerun because we have a different vintage. I believe we dabbled in the 17 or 18. This is the 2020, and then they do call it the Jasper Red Blend. And it is pretty well received, I would say, in the restaurant world. Don't really see it out much in wine shops. I'm not saying you don't see it out there, but generally speaking, you don't see this out a lot. Certainly haven't seen it in grocery stores. 
Um, this is not quite the typical, what I would call typical Bordeaux blend because of the percentages of Cab Franc being the number one player, Malbec being number two, and then Cab Sauv being uh, the minor, the, the third. And there's just like a little Petit Verdot and um, Merlot. And uh, those percentages change every year. Now this is a, this is a wine that is, uh, it's going to give you a very new world look, smell and feel. Um, it's for steak lovers, uh, cab lovers, you know, I think even Zen lovers, this is gonna be in your well well, I believe. So this was something that I know I got a lot of you out there that this, this checks a lot of boxes. I've got a lot of people that come regularly on Thursday nights. These are the kind of wines that they're looking for. Something a little robust, but rounded, silky, plush. And that's what Jasper brings. Now this is a, <clears throat> remember South Africa is a wine region that's rich in history, over 500 years of winemaking. You know, here we are talking about, you know, the how great it is that we have a winery that's been making wine for 40 years. That's a long time in Washington. And uh, we're talking, you know, we're decades versus centuries in terms of, you know, the background. Imagine what we can do if we have four or 500 years in Washington, because you can see what's happening in South Africa. The, the, the rich history, of course, South Africa is producing, you know, they're a top 10 country in production. They're a very serious wine area. And it's a very cool area. You know, we're down at the very southern tip of Africa. And of course, that means you're getting closer and closer to Antarctica, right? So it is getting cooler and cooler. And, um, you know, one of the things I think that a lot of people think of when we get into cooler climates, and it's usually pretty true, that there's not going to be as much alcohol. And, you know, Washington state wines tend to have an overabundance and they're moving far and far north. And yeah, this is a, this is listed at 14, but I guarantee it's more. Um, I just, you know, I just, I believe it. I don't say, I'm not saying it tastes like it's got hot alcohol, but it just seems uh, to me that it's got a little more, you know, a little more uh, under the hood, if you will. Um, but I want you to remember the, the, both of these areas are having longer days. They're having more hang time, sun time, day to day. And that creates more potential sugars, which become more potential alcohol. So yes, in cooler regions, there are certainly plenty of examples like in Germany and Austria and Switzerland uh, that, that certainly the wines are, are champagne even, that they're not getting a high ABV because the sugars aren't developed. Yes, that is a fact, but they don't have the same intense weather that Washington and South Africa do. So more sunshine, well, what can I say, more alcohol. So uh, this nose is gonna be very reminiscent of, uh, of a, uh, a modern Bordeaux, I would say, or outside of France Bordeaux. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but uh, uh, the Bordeaux style, I guess, that's outside of the actual Bordeaux region. clear evidence that there's been malolactic fermentation here, which gives it that soft, plush mouthfeel. Um, really restrained tannins here. This is a dry wine, but I would not call it grippy. It is absolutely delicious with dark fruit. Uh, there is, yeah, this is seen oak, but it's old oak, it's not new oak. It's more about mouthfeel for the oak. It's more about having a plushness. And I think that that is, for me, a more desirable style. I mean, I'm not knocking new oak at all, but there's something about the way the fruit pops when it's outside of new oak, when, it, when it's being softened or matured in two, three, four year barrels, I believe to me that that's better suits my palate. Also keep in mind 
that I'm pairing wine and food for a living. I'm not just drinking the wine and, you know, letting, you know, you know, doesn't really matter what I eat it, eat with it because it just doesn't really matter about the pairing. So I'm often maybe overly sensitive to that fact because that's what I do. So there's a certain element of that when I'm, when I'm approaching a wine like this. I, I've certainly had many really big oaky wines that I enjoyed, but I find myself being pulled more and more to a style that is oaked for texture rather than oak for flavor. Well, it is summertime too. You know, we, we're, we're, the, the thermometer is not saying it's overly hot. I mean, we're only in the high 80s, but the humidity is stupid. It's terrible. I have been soaked through my undershirt just to go to the bank and to the liquor store for the restaurant in a mere 15 minutes and I haven't recovered since. So it's, uh, it's, it's that kind of weather. So dialing down your wine's intensity in terms of oak, to me, is a natural thing to do this time of year. And so I would call this a, a big summertime rib. So we're not compromising intensity of flavor, but we are, we're having something that's a little bit fresher and cleaner on the finish but it still has things like nutmeg, cinnamon, licorice. It still has those type of flavors that you have from big oak calves and things of that nature. But there is a freshness here. And I would say that's pretty typical of South African wines anyway. I think that's one of the things that we talk about ad nauseum probably. But uh, that is certainly uh, the case. And I think that's important to remind everyone that summertime is a great time to have South African reds because they still bring the ABV that you're looking for. They bring the flavors that you're looking for, but they're not as weighty on you. So you can be, you know, I got this little, uh, yeah, this little shine on me, a little, little sparkle, a little perspiration here and I can still enjoy a red it's, you know yes refreshing whites and rosés they're certainly the way to go this time of year but you know what I also got to have my reds because I love reds and so picking where your reds are grown will be a huge advantage for you as you suffer through the dog days of summer for the next well it's gonna be a long I got a feel I got a feeling this is gonna be a late summer and that's gonna be a steady summer. So get dialed into your reds so you can enjoy them over the next three months without being overly weighted. And we're having Chef want me to pass it along that he is going to be having duck pastrami with this. And of course, we love pastrami spice. And pastrami spice on duck or salmon, and of course beef, it, it just works so well it, it, it kind of, it, you know, spice is great, you know, and I'm not, I'm not talking about those hot wings that I made for July 4th that no one would eat except for me, and uh, I probably shouldn't have. Gosh, they were good, but I was in tears. Not that kind of spice, more flavor spice, intense, uh, earthy, spicy flavors, and that is a very complimentary thing from the Jasper Red Blend because you're you're getting those spices but you're also getting some refreshment and lightness so that you know even though this isn't a Merlot driven wine you know it, it reminds me of Merlots in a lot of in a lot of sense because I've had so many duck and Merlot pairings and it's it's just one of my favorite things in the world to have of course you know there's plenty of cases for other varietals but I love Merlot and duck together. And uh, also I love duck or Merlot. <laughs> so that might have something to do with it, I don't know. But uh, this is a, this, this kind of style, it reminds me of like a big Merlot, with a big spicy Merlot, but it doesn't have the, the heavy finish. And so I think this is wonderful. Cab Franc is, you know, it seems like it's rarely ever the primary leader 
in a blend. It's, it seems to always be the second or third wheel. So, or it serves as a standalone varietal, and we certainly love those. Chef Chris and I are big fans of that. We're going to show you one next week as well. So enjoy this little cab front blend, and then next week we'll visit a full-on 100% cab front for you to get a sense of you know, what it would be like under different circumstances and conditions and blends. Um, I would like to thank uh, everyone for watching, and hopefully Chris will be sitting in our video next time so that we can banter back and forth. It's been a really fun week for us. We've had chef's tables and so many, like chef's pizza skills are through the roof because he's making 25 a day. And, you know, he's, he's, hopefully, I just hope that when it's all said and done, that we're not just a pizza restaurant, but boy, people are killing for his pizzas. And so that's part of the reason why he's not in this video right now. We have, uh, it's a bunch of big orders that, and like I said, a menu change going on at the same time. So he's up there. Oh, yeah, you know, he doesn't really toss his dough, but he's rolling it out and topping it up and blasting away in our little pizza oven. It's a lot of fun to watch. And uh, I think the whole staff's going to gain about 15 pounds because he keeps every day. He says, does anyone want a pizza? And of course, everyone says yes. So anyway. We're all gonna be fat and happy and that's okay. And we've got delicious wine to drink with our pizzas too. If you would like any of these wines and you're not part of the virtual pickup, you can always call a restaurant or email us here. I'd be happy to find a way if you're in state to, to get you hooked up with that. Or if you're out of town and you're not available for this week, just say, hey, can I come a couple weeks from now? I will have these wines for you waiting. That's what we do. We provide all kinds of wine services for people, not just not just the wines that we make here. We have a wine shop, and we, we create all kinds of avenues for people to enjoy wine. We think it's important. You know, I was telling someone the other day, it's like, you know, how many times have you heard about bar fights? You know, there's always like, oh, it's gotten some bar fight, or blah, 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 there's a motorcycle gang, or whatever it is. But you never hear about fights in wine bars do you because wine is a chill beverage and uh, i think we should all be chilling a little bit more of our glass of wine instead of stressing out about all the crap that's going on in the world let's make the world better and raise our wine glasses and drink up i want to thank griffin and Rats for beautiful wines and we'll continue to support these winers we'll teach you more about their wines in the future but please do support these boutique style wines whenever you get a chance and stay away from those big conglomerate mega purple using folks and get you some quality wine at quality prices. Thank you so much for watching our videos. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Check out one of our other 100 videos and keep us in mind if you ever need wine. Talk to you soon. Next week for sure.